Hi everyone. Hi. Again me. So before I exit call here, I just need to do a small announcement. So today, like yesterday, many of companies and many of you attendees like outreach to us and were asking us to set up some power pop like job interaction lounge. And we decided to set it up for this afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. in the Santa Barbara room. So on the other side of the escalator. It's the third room on your left. You will see it has a huge Santa Barbara room name. So from 2 to 3 p.m. We have already like five, six companies that are hiring. So you can go and talk to them and everything. And also if you want to, if you are in a company that you want to hire someone, just after this workshop, Go to the registration, tell the name, tell the job and everything so we can prepare a table for you to do that. Obviously it's like free, it has nothing to do with us. We just want to, the bridge, to, go, to be the bridge between the companies and the attendees. If you want to see what are the jobs available in the market and everything. From 2 to 3 p.m. at the Santa Barbara. Okay, to, to a start with Cole, well, Cole is very famous, so actually she doesn't need any introduction. As you may know, Cole worked with the storytelling with data using R, which actually is the new hot trend and hot topic that is happening. Maybe some of you don't know, she just had her first book published and released a few months or a few weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And we are celebrating after this workshop with having a book signing for her book. We have many copies of her book that we are gonna, she's gonna give us the honor to sign it for you. So just 12.30 at the book signing lounge. Just be there and she, you can talk to her and everything about that. And just to say how hot the topic of storytelling with data is, some of you that are from San Francisco, you know that actually two weeks ago there was a data story conference just focusing on telling the stories using data. So that is literally the hot trend of the day. And Cole is one of the pioneers in that sector. So well, probably all of you know that's the reason that this workshop is more than packed. So I'm, not, I'm gonna make it short. I'm just gonna leave the floor to her. Thank you very much for giving us the honor to be here. Everybody. And for folks who are hanging out in the back, there are still seats no matter up here if you want to come and take a seat. Uh, so good morning. My name is Cole, and I like to think of what I do as telling stories with data. Had the great opportunity to be able to work at and with some of the most data-driven organizations on the planet. But having all the data in the world isn't so useful if you can't make it mean something. Now, visualizing data effectively and using it to tell stories is one way of imparting understanding and inspiring action. So today, I'm excited to share with you some highlights of the lessons that I cover in my popular workshops and that I've written about in my new book, Storytelling with Data. What can the Wizard of Oz teach us about telling stories with data? Let's find out. Here's some facts on a slide about the Wizard of Oz movie. Go ahead and give these a quick read. these in a moment. In the meantime, I want to tell you a story. This is a story about one of my most memorable childhood Christmases. I was nine years old and I woke up before anybody else in the house and I got into our living room to find that Santa had left us some grand treasures. A plush beanbag chair, my family's first VCR, and a VHS copy of The Wizard of Oz. I can still remember the first time I watched that movie, seeing everything go from drab, gray, to brilliant technicolor. I watched that movie probably hundreds of times over the following years. 
And if I think about it now, I can imagine Judy Garland's voice singing somewhere over the rainbow, saying those words she's so famous for. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Or there's no place like home. All I have to do is think back to those sound bites, and I'm brought back to that place. I'm brought back to that room, sitting in my comfy beanbag chair, watching magic. And while we may not be able to create that sort of magic every time we communicate with data, there are some very powerful lessons to be learned from this. First, stories stick with us in a way that facts on a slide or data points don't often do. And if I ask you to recall some of those facts we looked at a moment ago, could you do it? Or what about an hour from now? Or a week from now? Unless there was something that you found really interesting or that resonated with you personally, you probably didn't take time to commit those facts to memory. But could you recount the story I just told you? I bet that you could. And that's the power of story that we want to think about trying to leverage each time we're communicating with data. Now, in addition to telling the story, we also want to think about how can we enable our audience to see the story in the data that we're showing. It's by combining the power of the visual with the power of the verbal that we put ourselves in a great position for success when it comes to communicating successfully with our audience. But nobody really teaches us how to do this which means we can really easily end up with graphs that look something like this. <clears throat> but have we seen a graph that looks something like this before? There is a story here, but my tool, Excel in this case, doesn't know what that story is. That's where it takes me as the analyst or the communicator of the information to make that story so visually and verbally clear that my audience can't help but see it that they can't help but walking away knowing what I want them to know. So we'll come back to this specific example soon. In the meantime, I want to give you a sense of what we're going to cover during our time together here today. So we're going to start off by talking about foundational stuff, the importance of context, having a really clear understanding of who your audience is and what you need them to know or do before you really spend a lot of time visualizing data or creating content. In the second lesson, we'll talk about some different types of common displays for communicating with data in a business setting. Look at some examples of each. In our third lesson of the day, we're going to talk about clutter and try to get comfortable identifying the stuff that's there that isn't adding information to our data visualizations and strip those unnecessary elements away. In the fourth section, we'll talk about how people see and how we can use that to our advantage when we're crafting visuals. How we can leverage things like color and size and the position on page to really draw our audience's attention to the important parts of what we are saying. And then finally, we'll come back to this idea of story uh, and think about never simply showing data, but rather making data a pivotal point in an overarching story. I'll make time, I'm sure we have plenty of time at the end for QA. So with that, let's start on our adventure. First lesson of the day is about context. I want to start by drawing one important distinction, which is the distinction between exploratory analysis and explanatory analysis. So exploratory analysis, you perhaps start off with a question or a hypothesis, or you may just be digging through data, trying to figure out what can I learn from this data that somebody else might care about. Once you've identified that thing or those things that somebody else might care about, then we move into explanatory space. And that is where you have something specific you want to communicate to somebody specific. It's this latter space we'll be concentrating on in our lessons today. So when it comes to explanatory analysis, there are a few questions that you want to be able to really concisely answer before you spend a lot of time visualizing data or creating content. The first is, who are you communicating to? Who is your audience? The more specific you can be about who that person is or who that group of people is, the better position you put yourself in to be able to form a data visualization or a communication that's going to resonate with that audience. So if I can think about my specific audience, I can think about things like, what does that audience care about? 
What motivates them? What keeps them up at night? And then I can frame what I need from them in terms of those motivating factors. After we've answered the first question of who our audience is, comes the question of what do we need them to know or to do? My view is when it comes to explanatory communication, we should always want our audience to know or do something. And we should be working through our data visualizations, through the communications in which they sit, to make that something as clear as possible. So it's easy if we simply show data for our audience to say, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing. Versus if we ask them for action, we make a recommendation, they have to respond to that. And even if they disagree, it starts a conversation. And it's a conversation that may never happen if we don't make that action, make that recommendation clear in the first place. It's really only after we've answered these first two questions, who's our audience, what are we going to know or do, that then we're ready to turn back to the data that we looked at in the exploratory part of the analysis to say, now given this scenario, what data do we have on hand that can act as evidence for this case? So to ground this in reality, let's take a look at the who, what, and how in context of a specific example. Go ahead and give this a read, and then we'll talk about it. Folks, clear on the scenario here. So you work for a startup. You have created this product uh, that you're getting ready to launch, and you're trying to figure out how do we price the product. Now, there are a lot of different considerations that go into this decision, but the one we're going to focus on here is how competitors have priced their products in the marketplace over time. And now you have a teammate who jumped the gun here. Like, oh, this is super interesting. I'm just going to go ahead and knock this out. We are done. How are we doing so far? Not so well, right? But before we get into the details of the graph, let's take a step back and think about our who, what, and how in this scenario. So when we think about who we're communicating to, they might be communicating to a lot of different people, but we still want to try to have that one person in mind. Uh, and one way of narrowing our audience is to figure out who the primary decision maker is going to be. So let's assume in this case that is the head of product. And when it comes to what we need to communicate to the head of the product, we want to create a shared understanding of what's happened in the competitive marketplace when it comes to pricing over time. Ultimately, we want to make a recommendation and have that recommendation be followed when it comes to the pricing of our particular product. And let's assume in this case we have data on hand that shows what the average prices have looked like for the competitive set over time. So store this example in the back of your head. We're going to keep coming back to it after each of the lessons that we cover so that you can see them applied in a real-world <coughs> scenario. This is a real-world scenario, by the way. The details have just been changed to pretend to be innocent. In the meantime, though, let's move on to lesson number two of the morning, which is about different types of visions. Right? Once we've taken the time to understand the context, know who our audience is, what they need to know or do, then when we have some data we want to show, we want to figure out how do we do that in that way that can we create that magical aha moment that data visualizations can sometimes do. Now, when it comes to showing data, usually the first things that come to mind are tables and graphs. But before we get there, we want to spend a couple of moments on the power of simple text. When you have just a number or a couple of numbers that you want to communicate, Think about using the numbers directly, physically writing them out. Something about taking a number or two and putting them in a table or a graph that, beyond potentially this being misleading, just causes the numbers themselves to lose some of their own. So you have just a number or a couple of numbers that you want to communicate. Think about using the numbers directly. When you have more data you want to show, typically a table or a graph would be the way to go. One thing to understand is that people interact very differently with these two types of visuals. Tables interact with our verbal system, which means that we read them. 
when I have a table in front of me, I usually have my index fingers out. I'm reading across rows, I'm reading down columns, I'm comparing values. And tables are great for just that. If you have a mixed audience, it's each way one with their own specific line of interest. Or if you have many different units of measure, that can sometimes be easier to pull off in a table than a graph. Graphs, on the other hand, interact with our visual system. Our visual system is much faster at processing information than our verbal system, which means a well-designed graph is going to get the information across more quickly than a well-designed table. Let's take a look at some common types of graphs. Uh, first off, the scatter plot. So scatter plots are awesome when you have data you want to encode simultaneously along horizontal x and a vertical y-axis. For example, that's we're interested in understanding how much an age varies by height, or vice versa. So here we have height in inches on our y-axis, age in years on our x-axis. Here's what the distribution looks like. Now that we've got this plotted, we can point out maybe some interesting things. The tallest munchkin was 410. Shortest munchkin, more than a short 2-4. Uh, the oldest munchkin was 68 years old. And not all munchkins were actual little people. Rather, I think 11 of them here were kids, 14 and under. Another common type of graph is the line graph. For example, we could look at the cumulative gross revenue for the movie Wizard of Oz over time. It looks sort of like this. And oftentimes, when we are plotting with a line graph, we are showing time along our x-axis. That is because when we're using line graphs, we want to make sure we're plotting continuous data. So most often, that's some measure of time, days, months, quarters, years. Imagine if we had categories on that x-axis, I'm posing this visual connection between them that probably doesn't make sense. So in this case, we have some interesting things going on. The movie was launched in 1939, but actually didn't really make any money until much later. Some odd shapes that we see here. So you might want to understand what's driving those. Perhaps annotate them directly on the graph so the audience has that information there as they're interpreting the data. So as we have that there, we can see Oh, it's actually the 98 reissue where all the money was made. Uh, and then we've got an IMAX release later that bumped that up even further. So annotating directly on graphs can work very well for helping set context for your audience, help explain the data, help make uh, interesting nuances understandable. Special case of the line graph is a slope graph, which is actually just a fancy word for a line graph that only has two points in time. Often we don't think about using a line graph when we only have two points in time, but depending on our data, it can actually work out quite well. For example, here's some data on Oz books sold between 1918 at the left and 1919 on the right. The really cool thing you get with a slope graph is an implicit understanding of the rate of change or percent change without ever having to use those words. It's implicit because of the relative slopes of the lines. So if the line slopes upward, it increased. Slopes upward more, it increased more. Now, whether a slope graph will work for your specific situation depends on the layout of the actual data. If you have a lot of crisscrossing lines, they can become challenging to label. Sometimes you can still get away with it by strategically emphasizing one or a couple of the lines and de-emphasizing others. So we talked about lines are for continuous data. When it's categorical data, you've got a bar chart is your very best friend. I think sometimes we avoid bars because they're common. My view is that's the wrong approach. We should use them and use them frequently because they're common. It means less of a learning curve for our audience for getting at the data. They already know how to read the graph. Bar charts, by the way, are very easy for our eyes to read. What our eyes are doing are looking at the endpoints of those bars. So it's very easy to quickly see which category is the biggest which is the smallest, and also the incremental difference between categories. There are a number of different types of bar charts. This is your standard vertical bar chart or column chart. Another common type is the horizontal bar chart. Probably the most frequent reason I see myself switching from vertical to horizontal is simply get a little bit more space to write those categories. Right? So you can see here, our categories, the cast of The Wizard of Oz, are written in diagonal text. Studies have shown diagonal text is about 50% slower to read than horizontal text. Vertical text, by the way, is even slower. So if efficiency of getting information across is one of your goals, avoid diagonal text at all costs. Ideally, in favor of horizontal. 
we take the same data and we shift it over to a horizontal bar chart. Now we've got some more real estate on the left to be able to write those categories in a way that our audience can easily read. Now, one decision point when you're visualizing data is whether to preserve the axis or to label the data points directly. And which you choose depends on the level of specificity that your audience needs to have with the data. So if you want your audience to focus more on the shape of the data, then I'd recommend showing the approach we have here. Leave the axis there, don't label the data term. On the other hand, if precise values are important, we might omit that x-axis and instead put the labels in the bars directly. So I get one more common type of graph here, the pie chart. So pie charts are interesting. We can say a lot of things generally about them, right? So with this one, we're looking at uh, preferred genres for children uh, across fairy tale, comedy, adventure, and other. It's very easy for us with this graph to very quickly say adventure makes up about 50%. But it's hard for us to say anything much more specific than that. When pieces are really big or really little, that's obvious very quickly. But when pieces are the same in size or when they're close, it's almost impossible to make maybe more nuanced observations like this piece is bigger than that piece by X amount, for example. And oftentimes our pie charts aren't even as clear as this. For some reason, pie charts seem to yearn to be dressed up, which means we often get them in flavors that look more like this. Right? If I ask you to use this to make a simple observation, which is bigger between fairy tale and comedy, could you do that? Not so well, right? So there are a couple lessons to be learned from this. Uh, one is pretty much a hard and fast rule. Uh, there aren't a lot of hard and fast rules when it comes to data visualization. It sits at this intersection between art and science. But there are a few. And one of those is never ever use 3D. <laughs> right? The only possible exception is if you're actually plotting a third dimension and it gets pretty tricky pretty quickly, so take care. But never for something like this, right? Here we have a single dimension, and we're making our data harder for our audience to get at by introducing this weird 3D and perspective that's tilting the pie, making values at the top appear smaller than they are, values at the bottom appear closer and less bigger than they are. There's no reason to do this. The other complicating factor we have going on here is that people's eyes have a hard time ascribing quantitative value to two-dimensional space. Said more simply, pie charts are hard for people to read. Our eyes just don't do a great job of measuring angles and areas, which is what we're asking our audience to do when we show them data in a pie. So I'd say, okay, that's fine, but let's say I have some data that looks like this. How should I show it? So I'd say, first, if you're absolutely married to the idea of a pie, let's at least improve the pie. So here I've made a number of changes. Taken away the 3D and that tilting perspective that was distorting the values. Take away the differences in color that weren't adding any information. We're actually making the visualization challenge a little harder. I've labeled the segments directly, both with the numeric values. There's no question as to what that is, as well as the category name, reducing that work of going back and forth between the data and the legend. But I'd also encourage you to think about not a bar, or not a pie chart. This is the same data organized as a horizontal bar chart. Here we can make more nuanced observations. We can see that fairy tale is in fact bigger than comedy, and we can see how much bigger it is. Now, we lose one thing with this transition from pie to not a pie, which is this built-in sense of there being a whole, and thus pieces of a whole. Try to tackle that here just by putting the percent of total label at the top there. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's one option to consider. What I'd like to advise is if you find yourself reaching for a pie chart, just pause and ask yourself why. If you can answer that question, you put enough thought into it to use the pie, but it probably shouldn't be one of the first sorts of visuals that we reach for because of some of the difficulties in interpretation. Now, we've just looked at a sampling of different types of visuals. This is also just a sampling of different types of visuals. There are a lot of different types of data visualizations out there. The good news is for the everyday stuff, the regular ones will meet most of your needs. In fact, I took a look at my work over the course of a year, and I categorized every single visual that I created. And I was surprised, because I thought this was going to be a really long tail, that there would be a lot of different types of graphs and other data visualizations. And so I was actually surprised that every single one of them fell into just 12 categories. These are the 12 categories you see here. 
one thing to notice is that for the most part, these aren't anything crazy, right? They're your standard line graphs and bar graphs. And as we talked about with the bar graph earlier, it's because our audience already knows how to read these. So when you can figure out if there's a way to get your message across using something your audience is already familiar with, you're already sort of one step ahead when it comes to making your message known. And if ever you're unsure, how should I visualize this data? What sort of graph should I use? Create the graph and hand it to a friend or colleague. Have them talk you through their thought process, what they see, what questions they have, what they pay attention to, what observations they make, can be really useful for understanding whether the visual you created is serving its intended purpose. Or if it isn't, give you ideas on where to concentrate your iterations. All right, let's take a look back now to the example that I introduced in the first lesson. So remember, you're working for this startup, trying to figure out how do we price our product based on competitor pricing over time. And your colleague started you off with this lovely graph. How's this feel to look at? Thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. Yeah, that's a lot of downward thumbs. This is much more complicated than it needs to be. So we'll look at a few iterations of this, more than you typically would, but I think it's interesting to see how when we look at different ways of visualizing this data, different things stick out more or less. Uh, so there's a call out at the top that we should keep in mind. Price has declined for all products on the market since the launch of product C in 2010. So let's keep that in mind as we're looking through this data. First thing I'm going to do is strip away all that color and watch just what that does. It makes it so much easier to see what's happening for a given product over its lifespan. And remember that original headline was what happened since 2010. So let's bring that part forward. Now if we concentrate just on the 2010 forward bars, we can see clear declines in product A and B when it comes to their pricing. But that's not what we see for some of these products coming on the market later. So we're going to want to revisit our takeaway in light of that. Now if we've been looking at bars this long over time, you're wondering why aren't we visualizing this on a line graph? You are absolutely right. Here's what that looks like if we keep it in the same setup. Notice how just that switch got rid of this artificial stair-step view that annual data does when it's plotted in bars. So with this view, we can very easily concentrate on what's happening for a given product over time. But if I want to understand what's happening in the marketplace in 2013, for example, this one would be very difficult then. So I want to allow for both of those observations. Then I want to think about how can I align all of these to a common baseline of time. Here's what it looks like when we do that. I still threw the color back in, and I have the legend at the bottom. We'll revisit that later. But if we take a look at this and try to figure out, is this going to work as a good base visual for what we want to get across? With this view, I can easily see for a given product what's happening over the course of time. I can also see for a given point in time what's happening across the landscape. So this will be a good base visual for us to use to build our story for our audience. Not done with it yet. We'll come back to it. But we are ready for lesson number three on the plug. So if you picture a blank page or a blank screen, every single item, every single element we add to that page or screen takes up cognitive load on the part of our audience, takes some brain power to process, which means we want to take a discerning look to the elements we allow onto our page or our screen or into our graph. And in general, try to identify anything that isn't adding informative value or isn't adding enough information to make up for its presence, and strip those unnecessary elements away. So as part of our conversation on clutter, I want to introduce the Gestalt Principles of Visual Perception. The Gestalt School of Psychology set out in the early 1900s to understand how individuals perceive order in the world around them. What they came away with are the principles of visual perception, still regarded today as how people interact with visual stimuli. Talk about them here because of some of the direct applications on our data visualizations. First principle is proximity. We tend to think of objects that are physically close together as belonging to part of a group. So one way we can leverage this principle is in tables. So in the example on the right, simply by virtue of differentiating the spacing between the dots, your eyes are drawn either across the, the columns, down the columns in the first example, or across the rows in the second. Next principle is similarity. We tend to think of objects that are similar color, similar size, similar shape, similar orientation, as belonging to part of a group. So again, we can leverage this in tables, use it to draw our audience's attention in the way we want them to focus it, and eliminating the need for additional elements like borders to do so. 
Third principle is enclosure. <coughs> the tendency of objects that are physically enclosed together as belonging to part of a group. Notice it doesn't take a very strong enclosure to do this. Light background shading is often enough. One way we can leverage the enclosure principle is to set a certain part of our data apart from the rest. Next principle is closure. This one's interesting to me. It says people like things to be ordinary, uh, to be familiar, to fit in the constructs that are already in our head. So most people will see those shapes first as a circle and only after that as individual pieces. One thing the Gestalt principles allow us to do is just question some of the things our graphing applications have historically done for us. Heavy borders, dark background shading. We can strip those elements away, and our graph still appears as part of a whole, and our data stands out more. Next principle is continuity. Some similar closure it says if I take the objects in panel one and I pull them apart, most people expect to see what's shown in two, where it could also be what's shown in three. So our eyes like to draw continuous lines, even where they may not explicitly exist. So we can play with stripping stuff out of our visuals, see whether or not we lose anything. So here, in the example at the right, I've taken out the y-axis line altogether. Your eye actually still sees it because of the continuity of space between the text and the data. As we saw in the last example, the more we strip away, the more our data stands out. We'll get one more of these today, which is the connective property. The connector property has a stronger associative value than similar color, similar shape. It's not usually stronger than enclosure, although that depends on the relative strength of the connection and the enclosure. So we play with that relationship through thickness and darkness of lines. One way we use the connector property frequently is in line graphs. Help our eyes make sense of what is sometimes a whole lot of data. So we've got a little theoretical there. We'll come back to practical application of this in a moment. Uh, but first, Easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons. This is an analogy that Colin Ware uses. He wrote a book called Information Visualization Perception for Design. The analogy is it's easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons, but as the variety of birds increases, that hawk becomes harder and harder to see. Or for our purposes, we might say something like, it's easy to spot a wicked witch in a sky full of pigeons. But throw in a bunch of flying monkeys, she's a little harder to pick out, right? In other words, the more we make different, the lesser degree to which anything stands out. Or said another way, if there's one thing that's very important, let's leverage contrast and think about making that the one thing on the page that's totally different from the rest. So let's continue with this idea of contrast and look at a specific example. So in a moment, we're going to put a graph up on the screen here. What I'd like you all to do is Tell me how that graph feels. Just shout out the first word that comes to mind and how that graph makes you feel. All right? I feel looking at this. Yeah, notice the general sort of groan we just heard <laughs> in the room. It's a sort of reaction we want to avoid in our audiences when we're communicating with data or, or, or at all. Uh, so let's take a look at what we have here. For this scenario, imagine you are a U.S. retailer, and you've recently surveyed your customers, as well as the customers of some of your competitors. And you're now looking at the data to try to see how do you fare? How do you fare across different categories, which is what we see on our x-axis, selection, convenience, service, relationship, price, and also how do you fare relative to the competition? So here we've scattered plot. Our business is depicted by the blue diamond. The rest of the competitors depicted by other various shapes. So now that I've explained it, it totally makes sense, right? Not so much. Uh, this is a case where we have to be really patient looking at this data to try to get any sense out of it. And even if we are really patient, sometimes we can't make the comparison that's most important to make because our business, the blue diamond, is obscured by other data points. So this is a case where we are not leveraging our contrast strategically. Take a look at what being thoughtful about contrast, as well as making some other more thoughtful design choices, can yield us with this same data. So here now, I've flipped the what was on the x-axis over to the y-axis. Now we have our categories going from top to bottom. And our business in blue is the one thing that stands out as very different from the rest. Here we're leveraging our contrast strategically. I can use this view to make two observations easily. 
I can scan across the blue, get a quick sense of how our business is doing uh, across the different categories. Or within a different category, I can focus on how our business is doing relative to the competition. Now, if we had another goal, if we wanted to quickly be able to see how our business is doing compared to competitor C, for example, this is not the view to use for that. So for that, I've come over this legend on the left, either count down or count up to figure out what position C is in, then put the blocks on the right, count down or count up to figure out, that's really taxing. So if that's our primary goal, this isn't the right view. But if our goal is more what's happening across these different, uh, different categories, how do we fare against ourselves across the categories, against our competition, this can do that as well. And again, it's about leveraging contrast and being thoughtful in how you use it. So take a look back now to this example we've been working our way through. Here's where we left off after choosing an appropriate visual. We now take a look at this with an eye towards clutter. What can we get rid of? Maybe. Border tools. The borders, what else? Do you think the border tools are markers? The data markers. Remember, every single element adds cognitive load on the part of our audience. You're adding a lot of different elements that are, are encoding information that's already there in the line. Now, that's not say to never use data markers, but to say use them on purpose and for a purpose, not because they happen to be included with whatever your graphing application uh, threw in. What else can we get rid of? Decimals. Yes. Trailing zeros on my y-axis labels, one of my pet peeves. They carry absolutely no information, and yet make the numbers look more complicated than they are. Get rid of them. What else? Lines. Red lines can go. What else is annoying about this graph? Diagonal text, right? We talked about is slower to read here. There's no reason for it, so we have plenty of space to make it vertical. How's it feel going back and forth between the legend and the data? Not horrible, right? But your eyes probably do a bit of bouncing back and forth when you first encounter this graph. That's the sort of work that we want to identify and alleviate for our audience so they don't have to do work to get at the information. Let's check out what happens if we make some of these changes. So first we're going to get rid of the chart board. Next, the grid lines. So it's amazing to me how much those two steps alone do in terms of making my data stand out more. Next, I'm going to get rid of all those data markers. In the next step, I'll clean up my axis labels. I will drop the trailing zero from the y-axis, orient the years horizontally on the x-axis. I'll also line up some tick marks that are sort of out of sync now. That gets us here. And notice now how we've cleared a lot of the clutter. We've gotten rid of a lot of the unnecessary things that we're adding cognitive to, which almost makes that work of going back and forth between the legend and the data more obvious than it was before. So to alleviate that, we can leverage the Gestalt principle of proximity. Put the data labels right next to the data they describe. While we're leveraging proximity, it's about also leveraging similarity. Make the data labels the same color <coughs> as the data they describe. It's just another visual cue to our audience that says these pieces of information are related. Helps ease the process. So we're moving in the right direction here. We aren't done with this visual yet, but we are ready to move on to lesson number four on focusing our audience's attention. So to continue our conversation on how people see, this is a super simplified picture of that process. On the left hand side, we have light refracting off the sewers. This gets captured by our eyes. We don't fully see with our eyes. Rather, our eyes act sort of like cameras, take pictures of the world around us, and pass those pictures, the electrical signals, onto our brain. And it's what happens in our brain that we think of as visual perception. Now, in the brain, there are a few types of memory that are important to understand as we're designing visual communications. We're going to focus on one of those today, which is iconic. Memory. Have you heard this term before? Iconic memory. So iconic memory is super short term. It's shorter than short term memory and information stays there for fractions of a second before it gets forwarded on to our short term memory. The really cool thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to a specific set of what we call pre-attentive attributes. Pre-attentive attributes are huge tools in our visual design tool belt. So let's actually pause and do an exercise here. So in a moment, you're going to put a bunch of shapes up on the screen. Your job is to count the pairs of ruby slivers. 
right? When you know how many pairs of slippers there are, shout it out. It's a race. You would like to win. Ready, set, go. Four, five, 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 this was sort of taxing though, right? You have to physically look through these four lines, look for slippers, which are kind of a complicated shape. Watch what a different exercise it is though, if I make one minor change. Don't have time to think, don't have time to think. Suddenly it's very quickly clear there are five pairs of ruby slippers in front of you because those five pairs of ruby slippers are the one thing that's different from the rest, right? Here I'm leveraging your iconic memory. I'm using the creatine attribute of Q in this case to make the shoes the one thing that's different. Going back to that idea of contrast that we talked about with Colin Ware and the Wicked Witch. This is super important because what this tells us is our pre-attentive attributes, if we use them carefully, can help us get our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know they're seeing it. Super powerful. Here are the attributes. I won't read through all of these, but notice as your eyes scan across the screen, they're just drawn to the one element within each group that's different from the rest. You don't really have to devote any conscious thought to picking it out. One thing that's important to understand about the attributes is that people tend to associate quantitative values with some, but not others. For example, most people will uh, expect a long line to represent a greater value than a short line. So my bar charts are intuitive for us to read. But we don't think of color or hue in the same way, for example. If I ask you which is greater, red or blue, it's not a meaningful question. This is important because it tells us which of the creatine attributes can be used to encode quantitative information and which should be used as categorical differentiators. Let's take a couple looks at creatine attributes in action. First, with a big old block of text. Go ahead and give this a scan, then we'll talk about it. All right, you don't have to commit a single bit of this to memory. I'm only having you scan it now, so you're not trying to scan it while I'm up here talking about it. It's one um, lesson in presentation 101. You want your audience to listen to you. Don't ever put this much text in front of them. Without other visual cues, this becomes like the Count Movie Slippers example all over again, where you're left to read this block of text, process it, maybe put on the lens of what's interesting or important, then maybe read the whole block of text again and put the interesting or important things back in context of the rest. But check out what happens as I use creative attributes selectively on this text. And notice as I do so how your eyes are drawn with differing strength to the different attributes. I can leverage bold, italics, color, size, capitalization, outline, underline, separate spatially, and now check out what happens when we use multiple creative attributes together. Suddenly we have something that is scannable. Studies have shown we have on the order of three to eight seconds with our audience, during which time they're determining whether they're going to continue to look at what we put in front of them or move on to the next thing. We've used our creative attributes well. Even if we only get that first three to eight seconds, we've gotten our main point across to our audience. So creative attributes are hugely useful at doing two things. First, signaling importance and drawing our audience's attention. And secondly, creating this visual hierarchy of information that says both audience, this is most important, look here first, as well as audience, this is next most important, look here next, and so on and so forth. As you can imagine, creative attributes are also hugely useful when it comes to visualizing data. Here's some generic data from our annual customer survey. We can see how we fared across a number of dimensions. Without other visual cues, though, you're left to process this information. It comes very much like the Calculity slippers or the block of text that we just looked at. Whereas if I'm the communicator of this information, I should have already done that. In which case, I can use some creative attributes, perhaps paired with some explanatory text, to draw your attention very quickly to one part of the data. Right? Price and convenience. We are doing awesome there. Let's pause and celebrate our success. Or I can use that same broad strategy to direct your attention elsewhere in the data. 
relationship and brand go, we're struggling in these areas. What can we do to positively impact change? This can be very useful, by the way, if you're live in front of your audience. This is a very simple example, but especially if you have more complicated data that you're looking through here, to be able to introduce your data and the details of it once, and then focus your audience's attention where you want them looking as you're, look, as you're talking through the different aspects that you want to highlight. Creative attributes really direct how our audience looks at what we put in front of them. Uh, without other visual cues, your audience will typically start at the top left of your screen or your page or your graph and do zigzagging Cs across. Uh, but creative attributes change that processing and they grab attention and can direct it in other ways. So notice here are a couple uh, posters from the original release of the Wizard of Oz movie. Notice how your eyes take them in in different ways. So for me, the first one, I start at the top left, and I first read Wizard of Oz, and then I'm drawn down the names on the right, and then maybe I process backwards to the left, the faces at the bottom. Versus on the right, I'm going in much more of a sort of flowy zigzagging because of the arrangement of shapes and colors and things to look at there. So when I think about how do you want your audience to process the information that you're giving them? How do you leverage creative attributes to make that clear, to make that easy? So one test that I like to employ when it comes to figuring out whether I'm using my creative attributes strategically, and that is the where are your eyes drawn test, where you create your visual and you close your eyes or you look away and then you look back at it and you just notice where do your eyes land first. So this is probably where your audience's eyes will land as well. So to make sure it's in the right place. So I thought we'd do this with a few images um, and talk about what we can learn about our, <laughs> our data visualizations. So I'll put a couple different images up here. When I put up an image, I want you to shout out where your eyes go first. Got it? Where do your eyes go first? Here. Green. Right? That green face because it's the one thing that's so different from everything else on the screen. That's the power of contrast and that's the power of creative attributes used sparingly. So you want to think about how you can leverage these strategic uh, approaches when you're visualizing the data. What about where do your eyes go? Here. We've got a few things tugging on our attention here, right? So for me, I go to the yellow, but if I try to look at the yellow, I've got hands on the left and shoes on the right tugging at my attention. Or if I try to focus on the shoes, I've got the yellow and the hands trying to pull my attention that way. Or if I focus on the hands and there are things off to the right trying to pull my attention. So you just want to be aware of this tension that it can create in your audience if you're emphasizing multiple things on a graph or on a page. Now, about where do your eyes go here? <laughs> Everywhere, nowhere, all at the same time, right? Colorful is an awesome goal for a rainbow. Colorful is not such an awesome goal when it comes to visualizing data. Because by making too many things different, we can get a really hard task on our clients to focus on anything. Check out the difference in how your direction uh, is paid or how your attention is paid here versus here. Right? That is the power of using pre-attentive attributes, especially color, sparingly. Um, and color itself is kind of unique uh, in the properties that it has. And when used strategically and used sparingly, is one of your most powerful tools for directing your audience's attention. So when I think about using color never to make something colorful, but using it thoughtfully to help your audience process the information. Use it to signal importance. On the topic of color, uh, well, let's talk about a few different aspects. So color also has this unique ability to uh, impart tone and evoke emotion. So you want to think about what is the overall tone you want to set with your data visualization or with the broader communication in which your data visualization sits. And then think about how you can use color to reinforce that tone. So we think about how color is used in the Wizard of Oz, it's used in a lot of different places, right? The ruby slippers, the yellow brick road, the emerald city. Each of these evoke sort of a different feeling because of that color that's associated with them. Now, any Google search on the topic of color and meaning or color and tone will reveal lots of lists that look something like this. 
right? We go to color spectrum and some connotations of different colors, right? Black is serious and powerful, blue, classic, uh, green, environmentally conscious, healthy, red is aggressive. So when I think about how you can use these natural associations that people have with colors when you're communicating with data. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a generic graph, right? Right now we're not using any color. Everything's gray. But check out how your feelings about this graph change as I change the use of color. So if I personally, I often design in shades of gray and then use a medium blue very sparingly as the audience look here. Cute. But I one time got told by a client that my visuals looked too nice, as in they were too friendly. Uh, this particular client was reporting the results of statistical analysis, and they were used to and sought a more um, uh, sort of um, clinical look and feel, I guess. Uh, so in that case, the major change I made was shifting everything where I was using blue to black. Notice how that changes the feeling of this graph. Black, by the way, pairs very nicely with um, short word sequences written all in capitalization. Um, for sort of a punchy feel. Or instead of shading in, we could just outline if we want to give a sense of opportunity, perhaps. Or notice how red going upward feels like a bad thing, whereas green going upward feels like a positive thing. Sometimes there are also brand colors that we want to think about folding in to the way we're visualizing data. But if you have a colorful brand, right, like you see it down in the corner there, doesn't mean that you need to use every single color in your data visualization. When I think about picking one or maybe two matching colors and using those as your audience look here cues. <coughs> so colors, as we've seen, they uh, influence the way people feel about our data in different ways. Uh, that changes, by the way, depending on where you are and depending on who you're communicating to. This is a color wheel done by David McCandless in the UK, uh, which I love because it's both at the same time sort of beautiful data visualization as well as a useful tool for data visualization. So it's called Colors in Culture. Uh, you can find it on his site, it's infoisbeautiful.net. And you can use this wheel to see what connotations different colors have in different cultures. So if you find yourself communicating to an international audience, this is absolutely something to keep in mind. Something else to keep in mind is that not everybody sees color the same. About 8% of men and half a percent of women experience some form of color blindness, which most typically manifests itself as difficulty in distinguishing between shades of red and shades of green, which means in general we want to avoid using shades of red and shades of green together when we're visualizing data. Or if there's useful connotation, you want to leverage that, right? Red went down, that's bad. Green went up, that's good. You can do so. Just make sure you have some additional visual cues there. Also make the numbers bold. Uh, put the plus and minus sign in front of them. Do something else to set them apart visually so you aren't inadvertently disenfranchising part of your audience. All right, so that's a bit on creative attributes and color. Let's look back now to this example we've been working our way through. Think about how we can use color to focus attention. So one of the things I'll often start by doing is pushing everything to the background. Make everything gray so that I have to then be very thoughtful about where I use my color, where I use these other uh, cues that I have on hand to draw attention and bring things forward. So in this case, there are a lot of different places we could emphasize. Uh, that original call out was what happened since launch of product C in 2010. So we might focus on the launch of C in 2010, what happened when it came to decreasing prices for product A and B since then. Or it might be interesting to talk about generally what we tend to see in this marketplace after the launch of a product is an immediate price increase followed by an eventual decline. Or the most recent point of data might be the most interesting. Any of these could be the right points of focus, depending on the story we want to tell, which leads me to our final lesson of the day. So think back now to those facts that I showed you at the beginning of our time together here today. If I asked you to recall now, some of them now, could you do it? What about another hour from now or a week from now? Facts on a slide, data points, don't tend to be so compelling or memorable. But as we talked about earlier, stories are memorable. So let me 
actually, quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with the story of Wizard of Oz? Have seen the movie or read the book? It's a good portion of the room, which is awesome. Um, bear with me, I'm going to tell you the version that resides in my head. And then we'll talk about what we can learn from this when it comes to communicating with data. So Dorothy is an orphan. She lives in Kansas with her dog Toto and her uncle Henry and Auntie Anne. And everything there is drab and gray. One day she's in her house with her dog, and a tornado comes and swoops up the house, and it carries the house away to this magical land called Oz. And Dorothy and Toto emerge from the house to find everything in this beautiful color that she's never seen before. They also encounter all these little happy people, the munchkins. And they're so happy because her house inadvertently landed on killing the Wicked Witch of the East, freeing them from the slavery she had them under. So they give her as a gift the ruby slippers that the witch had been wearing. And they tell her, follow the yellow brick road. It will take you to this magical place, the Emerald City. In the Emerald City lives this wizard, Oz. And he can help you get back to Kansas. So Dorothy and Toto set off, they're on their way towards Oz, and they meet a number of characters along the way, make some friends, and each of these characters is finding, you know what, they're wanting for something too. And so they're going to accompany her on her journey and see if Oz can grant their wishes as well. There's a scarecrow who really wants a brain, a tin man who's longing for a heart, and a cowardly lion who really is wishing for courage. So they set off, they encounter and overcome many obstacles along their way. Flying monkeys, uh, big crevices that they have to figure out how to cross, fields of poppies that put them to sleep. But they make their way past each of these challenges, and they get to Oz, the Emerald City, and they ask him to grant their wishes. He says, sure thing, I'll totally do that for you. You just have to go kill that other Wicked Witch, Wicked Witch of the West, first. So they're really disheartened at this point, they're thinking, we don't know how we're going to do that, but they set off to try to find the witch, figure out how they can kill her. And Wicked Witch, though, captures them in the meantime. Um, which is, again, they're thinking like, okay, how are we gonna get ourselves out of this? Uh, but Dorothy, at one point, throws a bucket of water on the witch, not realizing then that that's actually all it takes to kill the witch. Witch melts, she's dead, they rejoice, because now their wishes will be granted. So they head back to Oz, talk to the wizard, Come to find out, he's actually not this great, powerful wizard. Rather, he's this little old man. Uh, but he helps convince them that actually they've demonstrated uh, that they have some of these things that they sought. And so to the scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion, he gives them a token of what they were wishing for, which makes them feel like their wishes were granted. But for Dorothy, it's sort of hard to fake getting her back to Kansas. So he devises a plan to build a hot air balloon that's going to carry both of them, he's from Omaha, I think, uh, both of them back to their homes. But the balloon accidentally goes off with the wizard without Dorothy and Toto. So again, she's left in this place going, I don't know how I'm going to get home. But then one of the good witches comes to her and says, Dorothy, the way to get home has been with you that whole time. You're wearing these magical ruby slippers. You just have to click your heels together and tell them where you want to go and you'll be taken. So she does this, right? That's that famous scene where she's clicking her heels together, she's holding Toto, and she's saying, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. She gets brought back to Kansas, which is no longer a drab gray place. Rather, it's got some color going on now. Because Dorothy's come to realize that she doesn't want to be in the most magical land. She wants to be where the people around her who love her are. So it's a happy ending for everybody, except those wicked. So what does this tell us, though, about communicating with data? So for me, stories like Wizard of Oz are evidence of a couple of things. First off is the power of repetition. You consider, you probably have, it's probably been some amount of time since you've given any thought to the story of Wizard of Oz. And yet, as I was telling the story, it was peaking parts of your memory. It's like, oh, actually, I remember that part. Oh, yeah, that's how those pieces tie together. Now, for me, it's really because of the power of repetition. As I mentioned earlier, I watched that movie probably hundreds of times as a little girl and read the book a number of times. And there's something about that repetition of use, of hearing and seeing and saying and reading things multiple times that helps form a bridge from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. It helps things stick with us. The other cool thing that stories like Wizard of Oz demonstrate for us is this 
magical combination of plot and twists and endings that enable things to stick with us in a way that we can later recall and retell to somebody else. So when I think about how we can leverage these concepts of storytelling, both the power of repetition as well as this combination of plot and twists and ending to get the stories that we want to tell with our data to stick with our audience and to stick with them in ways that they can later recall and retell to somebody else. So let's talk a bit first about the power of repetition. I want to introduce the concept here, which is called Bing Bang Bongo. So this applies um, probably most directly to presentations and reports, which are often uh, what I find are the means for communicating the results of uh, analyses in a business setting. We want to think about also how you can use the power of repetition if that isn't the um, forum that you're using, right? In a given data visualization, how can you leverage repetition when it comes to the titling and the callouts and the data you're showing? But here, Bing Bang Bongo is a concept that was introduced to me by my eighth grade English teacher when we were learning to write essays. And the idea was you should first tell your audience what you're going to tell them, Bing, or the introduction paragraph in your essay. Then you should tell them what you're going to tell them, Bang, the body of your essay. And then you should end by telling them what you just told them, Bongo, the conclusion at the end. Now, this works very well when it comes to communicating with data as well, right? We think about presentations or reports that contain our data. You could start off with a sort of executive summary or the main story that says, here, audience, is what we're going to cover today. Then go into the main details, right? You can go into the details of your data, of the analysis. And then finally, recap for them what you just covered, setting them off ready to act. It leverages this power of repetition that we talked about. Because now that your, your audience is no longer hearing something once, they're hearing it three times. On the topic of repetition, these repeatable sound bites that we've, talked, we've touched upon a couple of times with Wizard of Oz can become another way of getting your audience to hear you and getting your message to stick with them. Right? If we think about some of the repeated phrases from the Wizard of Oz, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my! All I have to do is think of those words, and I'm brought back to that scene in the movie where Dorothy and the Tin Man and the wizard, or excuse me, the scarecrow, have their arms linked and they're going into the woods, fearful of what they might encounter. It's right before they get the lion for the first time. Or there's no place like home, brought right back to that place where Dorothy's clicking her heels together and imagining Kansas. So when I think about whether there are repeated words or phrases or concepts that you can be leveraging when you're communicating with data to help bring your audience back to those places in your communication when you say them or when they see them. Then there's this combination of plot and twists and ending, right, that we talked about with Wizard of Oz and with other stories like that. When we're communicating with data, the plot becomes what context is essential for our audience. What do they need to know in order to be in the right frame of mind to be ready for what I'm going to tell them? Then the twists, what's interesting about the data and what it shows. By the way, there isn't anything interesting about the data, don't show the data. Run the risk of losing our audience's attention when we do have something important to say to them. And then finally, the ending, the call to action. What do we want our audience to do? Again, my view is when it comes to explanatory uh, communication, we should always want our audience to do something. And we should be working through our words, through our visuals, to make that something as clear as possible. So we simply show data, it's easy for our audience to say, oh, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing. But if we ask for action, our audience has to respond to them. Even if they disagree, it starts a conversation. And it's a conversation that may never happen if you simply show data. So let's take one last look back to this example that we've been working our way through. We ended with a pretty picture. Uh, but we want to think about how can we use this pretty picture to lead our audience through a story. So first off, let's add the words that have to be there. Descriptive, graph title, axis title, footnotes. And now let's think about how can I use this as a base visual to get my audience to experience a story. So I start off by setting the plot, right? The next five minutes, my goal is twofold. First, I want to create a common understanding of what's been happening in the competitive landscape when it comes to pricing of these products over time. Secondly, we're going to make a recommendation based on our analysis. We want you to take into account when you're pricing the product. So as we take a look back over the course of time, before I even put any data in front of you, let me give you a 
a quick rundown of what we're looking at here. We have average retail price on our y-axis, ranging from zero at the bottom to 500 at the top. Time on our x-axis, ranging from 2008 at the left to our latest data point, 2014 at the right. Now, products A and B were both launched in 2008, price points of 360 plus a piece. Over time, they followed a similar trajectory, with B always slightly undercutting as of the latest data point, 2014, they're priced pretty tightly, 250, 260 respectively. But something interesting happened over time. New products were introduced, and they were introduced at much lower price points. But all have increased since their respective launches. And in fact, what we tend to see in this marketplace is post-launch an initial price increase, followed by an eventual decline. Looking back again at this latest data point, they're priced pretty tightly when we look at the expansion uh, that there was, or the wide range that there was historically. Right? Average retail price of 223, range from 180 at the low end to 260 at the high end. Therefore, our recommendation is to price initially just below that, in the 150 to 200 range. Check out how far we've come. Right? We're not simply showing <coughs> data, but rather we're applying all of the lessons that we've talked about here today. Having a robust understanding of the context, choosing appropriate visual display, eliminating clutter, drawing attention, and telling a story. So we're not simply showing data, rather we're telling a story with data. We're making data a pivotal point in an overarching narrative. So that's the meat I have to go over with you today. I'll do a quick recap and then turn it over to Q and A. So just give you a quick reminder of the path we took. Start off by talking about context having a really clear understanding of who your audience is and what you need them to know or do before you really spend a lot of time visualizing data or creating content. Then we talk about different types of displays and use cases for each. Remember when you just have a single number or two, think about using the numbers directly. Line charts are typically for continuous data. Bar charts are your best friend for categorical data. And with area charts, pie charts in particular, just be judicious in their use because of some of the difficulties that we talked about when it comes to interpreting. And in general, think about what you want to enable your audience to do with your visual and how you can construct it in order to enable that. In the third section, we got comfortable identifying and eliminating clutter, the stuff that isn't adding information. While we eliminate clutter, we also want to think about what remains and how we can use things like color and size and position on page to draw our audience's attention, which we talked about in lesson four. And then finally, we spent some time on the importance of story and how we can leverage things like the power of repetition and this combination of plot and twists and endings to get our stories to stick with our audience. So just to give you a sense, uh, this was just a highlight of lessons that are covered in much greater depth and with many more examples and tips and insight into the design and thought process in my new book, Storytelling with Data. Um, the chapters are listed out on the left-hand side there, so you get a sense of how some of these topics fit in with other content. So I totally recommend checking that out. Um, as Mama mentioned before, I'll be doing a sign after we get done today, so if you're interested in more, uh, definitely stop by and check that out. And with that, I say a very big thank you. Them and you're there to do the voiceover to answer questions, to go into more or less detail as needed. 
But then for the thing that carries on, right, that's sent later as a takeaway or sent around to people who weren't there, that needs to be much denser because you're not there to do the voiceover. Uh, so ideally, those two work products would be totally different. You have your sparse slides for the meeting and then your dense report sort of thing uh, for the takeaway. What often happens, though, is just a single document is made, uh, usually for lack of time. Uh, and so the single document ends up being this, being this uh, slide unit, where it's uh, inevitably too dense to be on the big screen, uh, but maybe not dense enough for the takeaway. So a couple strategies you can employ there. Uh, one is leveraging animation, sort of in the way that we looked at with that final example of talking through piece by piece, uh, in which case I would have one final version that has all of that annotated on there sort of similar to what we looked at with the line graph earlier, and so then that one final annotated version is what gets sent around. Um, you can also leverage, uh, if you're using PowerPoint, you can leverage that summary or notes pane in PowerPoint to have your voiceover there um, so that you've got all the context and <coughs> additional data if you need to, to pull in there. Uh, an appendix is also something that you can leverage if you want to keep your slides and your data sort of sparse and on point, but then it allows you to have more detail to back that up. And then you can always have a note on the given page that says, you know, more detail on this, check out page, whatever the appendix. Or a couple strategies to try to employ. Um, but yeah, definitely a challenging scenario. We're question way in the back. Yeah, great question, which is on tools. Uh, so what we looked at, everything we looked at today was done in Excel. I find myself mostly using Excel because I concentrate in static visuals where you have a story you're trying to tell, and it's what most of my clients use. Um, Tableau is another hugely popular sort of out-of-the-box tool uh, for visualizing data, and it's awesome for the exploratory piece because you can sift through um, different visuals of the data very quickly. You don't have to start from scratch with a graph each time. You know, certainly programming, programming languages, you've got R, D3, you know, all of these, um, depending on your needs. My personal view is, you know, any tool can be used well, any tool can be used poorly. Uh, so pick a tool, get to know it as best you can, so that it doesn't become a limiting factor when it comes to being effectively, able to effectively visualize your data. Which is sort of a way of sidestepping that question all the time. Other questions? Yeah, right here. So, uh, the Thanks for the talk, it was great, yeah. so learned a lot. Uh, so one question I have is like, by making data really look simple and graphs, like, you know, so like some people might not appreciate the value, like, you know, the work you have put into it, right? Yeah. So how do you um, suggest to, like, you know, how do you trace that? Yeah, yeah, the question was about simplicity, right? If it looks too simple, then you run into credibility issues, right. maybe, or people thinking that you've oversimplified. And so definitely it all comes back to audience, and thinking about who is your audience for this particular thing, and how much detail do they need? Uh, do they need, do they want, uh, and uh, credibility is something to keep in mind. So if you have not yet established credibility with your audience, uh, having more data on hand to be able to show is one way of establishing that, right? One way of showing the robustness of the analysis. You just want to make sure that that other data isn't taking away from your story, uh, which is one reason I like the approach of having <coughs> a very on-point story up front where your visuals support that. Um, but then have other things on hand that you can either refer people to or maybe as a pre-read or as a takeaway uh, to give sort of that feeling of robustness to it. Because what you don't want is if you throw in every bit of data that you have, I sort of, I think of it like um, hunting for pearls in oysters, right? If we think of the explanatory or exploratory, explanatory process that we talked about earlier, the exploratory is opening all these oyster shells, trying to figure out where might there be one or two beautiful pearls. But then when you've identified the one or two beautiful pearls, really that's all we should show the audience. But there's a great desire to want to take all those oyster shells and <coughs> hand them over to the audience and say, I already opened all these, I know where the pearls are, but how about you go through and open them too, see if you can find them, which we don't want to do, right? Because we run the risk of those pearls getting totally lost in all the shells. Um, but there is evidence of robustness of the analysis and other sort of good things that you do get from showing those shells. So you can think about a way to pull the story up front Leverage some of the things that we've talked about here, but then have some of that other data on hand that you that you can refer to. Uh, and for anything that goes in the appendix, especially, don't worry about doing the stuff that we talked about here, right? Because that's just data that you can have on hand if you need it, or again to help with that um, understanding of robustness. And none of this is about oversimplifying, right? It's more about not overcomplicating and really thinking about who your audience is and how do you get that message across to them. Yeah, question here. 
So these size of visualization techniques, which you obviously are master of, you're also a master of presenting, talking, or storytelling. And I think those are different skills. Absolutely. Um, what, what else have you done to, to develop this? Great question. So the question was, um, you know, being able to show data in an effective way is one thing, but then also to be able to present the data. Um, so one thing I'll say straight out is that was not always the case, right? I used to be one of those people who, my hands would be shaking so much when I got up, I couldn't use a microphone like this because it would be too distracting, and I'd like forget to breathe, and it was just a hot mess. Uh, practice, right? With all of these things, practice and practice and practice, and watching yourself and. Um, you know, getting feedback and knowing your content well and having something that you are passionate about that you're talking about, all of these things help. Um, for me, the storytelling piece especially doesn't feel comfortable. Um, I'm getting to a point where it feels more comfortable, but I, I'm an analyst by training, right? Which means I like to lock myself in a room behind a computer screen and not talk to people. Uh, but to be able to teach people, you have to sort of get over that. Uh, and um, yeah, practice is really, um, you know, that repetition of flexing those muscles even when they don't feel familiar. And for me, when it comes to the storytelling piece, it's about practicing those stories so that by the time I deliver them in front of an audience, like this today, it feels natural, right? Because I always used to think like, oh, that person is a master storyteller. I can never do that. But you can't. It's just, it's practice and it's getting comfortable with it. Um, and yeah, a lot of time and effort. Great question. Yeah. Um, how did you come to the real aspect of communicating with data and presenting it effectively is like, you know, what you're good at and what you're passionate about to the point that, you know, you're doing your full time, yeah. writing books and everything. Yeah, great question. So for me, it was always this interesting thing, right? I mentioned I'm sort of an analyst by training, uh, so a lot of time in math and those things, but also was always interested in the business side. So for me, being able to visualize was one way of bringing those two interests of mine together. And for me, it was always interesting, so if you think of the entire analytical process, you start off with a question hypothesis, then you have to go get the data, and gather the data, and clean the data, analyze the data. At the end of that, it's easy to just throw it in a visual <coughs> and be done with it. Whereas that visual is the only piece of the entire process that your audience ever sees. So it deserves at least as much attention as the rest of it. Um, so for me, it was, I think, both recognizing that, for me it was, Finding a way to bring creativity into mathematics and statistics, which is not usually such a creative place. Um, I found over time that I liked this and uh, my work was getting recognition because of it. And then it was just sort of a self perpetuating uh, thing of realizing, you know what, there's something here. People appreciate it when it's done well. I think I can do it well. I think I can teach others to do it. And just sort of developing that over time. It was never a strategic, like, this is the direction I'm going, right? It's sort of figuring out. Where where can you where do you have fill a niche um, that other people appreciate that you enjoy doing um, that you can sort of use to propel uh, with? Thank you. Can you give us some advice on how to improve uncertainty in the story? Great question. Yeah. So uncertainty uh, you can think about both in terms of sort of the narrative, the story, the voiceover, as well as how you actually show the data. Uh, you know, because we can think of if we're that the example that we've looked at with the product pricing, those are thick, bold lines, which tells you like there's good, thick, bold data behind that. If that's not the case, then I might want to think about how do I give a sense, both visually as well as in the way I talk about it, that there is less certainty there. Um, visually, one way to do it is to never show a line or a point, or to not show a line or a point, but you can think about maybe make lines dotted, it gives a sense of uncertainty, or you put a shaded range around them to give a sense, you know, especially if you're doing some sort of forecasting to say, not only this is the point estimate, but also here's the confidence interval around it. You can actually think about visualizing some of those, uh, you know, whether it's the range around it or something else to give a visual sense of the uncertainty. And then I think the way you talk about it and the way you um, set up sort of any assumptions and methodology become really important as well. Um, and you want to think about, though, whether the uncertainty is likely to or whether it could lead to a different conclusion, right? Or if even given the uncertainty, the sort of the course of action is the same. Because those are two very different scenarios when it comes to how you build the story around it and sort of how confident you want your audience feeling when you walk out of there, right? If this is a sure thing and we know the numbers and they are the numbers and that's not going to change, or if, hey, actually we've estimated these things or there's a lot of variance, so you know, take these other things into mind, in which case you might also want to think about 
and never showing just one option, but the scenario of what could be, right? And show some tail events to create that um, uh, feeling that there is uh, uh, uncertainty around it. Great question. Other questions? Uh, how do you get effective feedback on your visualizations, especially like actionable? <coughs> Yeah, so for me, one of the best ways to get feedback is create the graph or create the page and show it to somebody else and have them talk you through their thought process. Um, what do you like? What do you not like? What's clear? What's confusing? What observations do you make? What questions do you have? It can be really useful for understanding whether what you're trying to get across is happening or not, right? And if it isn't, then that's when you want to go back to the drawing board and think about, okay, is it that I need to visualize this totally differently, or is it that I need to draw attention in a different way? And you can sort of um, try out different things. Or if you're uncertain and you have maybe a couple potential views, getting other people's input on those uh, can be helpful, again, just to see which do people, which group speaks to people in the way you want it to. Or when I'm at the point where I sort of, I know what the overall approach is going to be, um, but I'm still making more minor refinements. I'll do sort of what I call the optometrist approach, where you, know, you make your latest and greatest version of your visual, and then you make a copy of it, and you make one change to the copy. And you're always comparing what's better, A or B, and always preserving your latest and greatest and doing that comparison one by one. So usually looking at things side by side, you can tell pretty quickly which is going to be more effective, or if a change that you make worsens it, in which case then you can sort of undo it and go back for a couple of strategies. Any questions? Yeah, interactive visuals are a concept that we didn't talk about at all here today. There's absolutely a use case for them. Um, I will encourage folks, though, to question the assumption that your audience always wants to do. Because um, I think sometimes we think our audience wants to do more than they want to. Sometimes they even tell us they want to do more than they want to. Because the risk, or one of the risks with an interactive visualization is for the audience who's not apt to want to dig and play with it, they may miss whatever knowledge there was to get out of it. So one way of marrying the two, both the explanatory that we talked about here, but also allowing that ability to dig, is to pull out a high-level story or some of the meta points, put those in words, highlight them, but then also give the ability of the exploratory. So that for the audience who's not likely to dig, they still get something out of it. The audience who is likely to dig, they've got a way to do that. Then you also want to think about if you really want your audience to dig and you don't want predefined stories for them, then you actually want to stay away from some of the things that we talked about today, specifically when it comes to use of color. So as soon as you highlight one story with color, any other story becomes almost impossible to see. So you just want to sort of keep those in mind. When it comes to um, great examples of interactive visuals, you know, New York Times is the first that comes to my mind, right? It does really amazing things. And they follow that approach where they'll have a headline and maybe some points that tell you the main thing, but then you know you can zoom in and see, you know, what is it for people of your education or in your city or whatever may be relevant and sort of dig around that, which is a nice way of marrying this to Great question. Other questions? Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. If, if you have an audience with very mixed sort of background and technical abilities. Yeah. Um, do you focus on the lowest common denominator to try to mix in? Mixed audiences are inherently the most challenging. Right? So the question was if you have an audience who's mixed when it comes to um, levels of technical um, capability. And the risk in going with the common communicating to the common denominator is then you might have the people who already know what's going on totally tune out. And so my first advice would be is there a way to separate the two? Sometimes there may be, other, other times that'll be totally impossible, right? And then you want to think about it, if there's not a way to separate them, what else can you do to either bring the one group up to speed um, without boring the others, or get the others so they're going to be patient while you bring the other groups up to speed? So some strategies there, right? you could send around a pre-read or something to folks who need maybe a primer on something before they get in the room. Or you can actually set expectations with the audience when you get in the room to say, hey, I know some of you folks already you know, are masters on this stuff, but I want to get us all on the same page so we can have a really productive conversation. So it's going to take five minutes now. We're going to go through some of the backstory, get everybody on the same page, and then we'll carry on from there. And you can go in your backstory and then make sure you get everybody's attention back, right? Hey, folks, now anybody who tuned out, we're ready to move on. Um, so you can sort of, by setting the audience expectation up front and telling them that's what you're going to do before doing it can create a little more patience versus if you start going into it and part of your audience is like, I know this stuff, and they tune out. Um, or a couple strategies. 
yeah, that's inherently challenging. So mixed audiences are hard. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, here. Um, in my work, I have an audience that is designers, uh, creative art artists, and basically most of the people don't like the numbers. And uh, so, how do you do you deal with uh, that kind of audience when you need to work with them and uh, show the uh, the value of the that analysis for marketing for ma for improve the the marketing campaigns. Yeah. So the question is, if you work with a lot of people who don't know data or don't like data, yeah. how do you get that, them to want to use it when they need to when they're making decisions? I, yeah. Basically, I need that they use my dashboards and but they have to understand it. So, yeah. yeah. And so we're talking about sort of circles around this idea of acceptance. Right? Anytime you're designing anything, whether it's a product or a data visualization or a dashboard, as you mentioned, you need your audience to be accepting of it before you can do anything with it, right? So if they're not willing to sit with it. Um, so if you're finding that's not happening, uh, a couple of things you can try. So one is sit, like if, if there's a friendly member of your audience or somebody who is maybe more interested in the others, then maybe sit with that person and try to figure out why, why am I not getting adoption? Are there things that are, are maybe inherent to the design or things that I could do differently that would help uh, get that acceptance, um, get their input, get their feedback? Because sometimes that in and of itself will then make you sort of more accessible and approachable when it comes to then talking to some of the others. So you want to think about always when, if you're getting resistance, whether it's to a data visualization or to a dashboard, whether it's, where there may be an issue in the design. And it won't always be, certainly. Um, but one way to test that is just by trying to talk to your audience about it. Or find a third party, a non-biased party, to get some feedback from, right? To say, hey, if you spend a couple minutes looking at this, does it make sense? If they're able to sort of get what you need your audience to get out of it, can give you some um, ideas of whether, you know, whether there may be something about the actual visualization that makes it hard, um, or if it really is just resistance in the audience. Then you want to think about, okay, if I'm getting resistance in the audience, how can I help with that? Can I meet with each of them one-on-one -on -one and actually spend some time walking them through the data? Or do you have stories about how data has either you know, helped in the past or how the lack of data has hurt in the past um, to try to get people on board? Or if there's somebody who is influential in the organization who you can get on board who might be able to bring some of the other people along. It's really what you describe as sort of a change management process, right? Because people who haven't historically been data-driven and you're trying to make them data-driven, uh, that's a hard place to be. Um, but you can employ some of these strategies to try to um, bridge that gap. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we have time for maybe, oh, we don't have time because that sign says stop. Uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.